Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview one another one of my gurus and heroes from the Fast AI community, Silvain, who's a research scientist at Fast AI. In this interview, we talk about a lot of excitement upcoming developments from the Fast AI research lab, the framework, the book, and the upcoming course. The upcoming course will be released along with the book and the library as a MOOC later. around the middle of this year again i am not too sure of the dates but i think you can follow jeremy and silvain on twitter to best stay up with date on it we talk all about what can we expect from the library the course and the book what sorts of efforts go into these and what topics is the book and the course going to cover the newer version i think of fast day as a tv series as a movie whose sequel always keeps getting better so i am really excited to be talking about all of these with silvain silvain also shares with us how does he and jeremy approach research ideas and how do they collaborate on these ideas this interview contains many exciting exciting upcoming insights from the fast day lab so i'm really excited to be releasing this interview without further ado here's my interview with silvain all about fast day the course the book and the new framework fast ai v2 please enjoy the show hi everyone it's it's an unbelievable honor for me to have silvain my hero from fast ai for the second time on my interview series silvain thank you so much for joining me on the interview series again uh, thanks for having me it's a honor to have you um now i want to talk about one thing uh, in a previous interview you mentioned you discovered fast ai through new york times articles did you expect yourself to be working with jeremy a few years after you read that article uh no not really <laughs> i must <mentioned>. say <laughs> talking about uh, what, could you tell us what how did the dots connect for you how did you end up joining the team uh, what was jeremy's hiring process like oh uh i mean i still don't really know to be honest because like the course went on and i was kind of doing things but not really i didn't have anything in mind except learning as much as i could so i was doing all those kind of projects and when jeremy was laying off all kind of those challenges on the forum so and and i kept responding and answering and showing good and yeah and then the course ended and a week after he asked me oh would you like to work at fast at the ai and i was like oh sure <laughs> i would be so not to work at fast at the ai and that that's kind of how it went okay but there was no and, formal um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no formal process or okay how how has the journey been on the other side for you i think it's almost been 2 years since you joined the team uh, can you tell us how has the journey been any highlights from those years yeah so uh, began in july so one year and a half almost two years you're right um how has it been uh a bit tiring <laughs> uh very i, I learned uh, I, i learned a lot uh, obviously with journey and uh i don't know you you think the results like you seen the course you see everything we do the, the library so i'm guessing it's more like <laughs> how do you think it went <laughs> like because i think being a team of two instead of just Jeremy working on the course or, or, or the library uh, as allowed us to to have something a little bit bigger and make the project uh, a little bit more interesting yeah 
And it's, yeah, it's been an honor and it's been very rewarding to be a part of that. Okay. I, I don't think, uh, you mentioned this also when I had the chance to meet you. I don't think both of you ever sleep. Is is that true? <laughs> yes, we do sleep. <laughs> sometimes. <Okay>. Sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night and I see that Jeremy is pushing things. I'm like, why are you still awake? <laughs> <laughs> And many response, what are you awake in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you end up doing more stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> C- can you tell us about uh, a current day in your life? What tasks are you taking on right now? Uh, I believe the book is also just coming to uh, the final draft and any other tasks that occupy your daytime right now? Uh, so the focus has been on the book until because we we delivered the draft last Monday. So up until <laughs> two days okay. ago, it was like working on the book uh, at any hour of the day. And now we are like kind of relaxing for a week uh, because it was a bit intense. And uh, so right this week, it's more like focusing on every bug that I postponed because we had to finish the book. <laughs> And then we will work on the on the documentation uh, of like fast core, fast AI, uh, fast AI version two. I mean, uh, so that it's all starting to get ready for the for the new course. Okay. In March. Is it is it your zero? I think you call it the zero inbox, zero bug OCD kicking <laughs> in, where you ensure that the repo has zero. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm always getting triggered if there is like one issue or one PR standing. So I try to address everything because I like seeing those zero numbers. Okay. And since we, I mean, we keep issues for bugs only often. So the features are more discussed on the forum or like any kind of discussion in general, we prefer to have it on the forums. It's more like what's on GitHub is pushing issues and I try to solve that uh, as quickly as I can. Okay. Now, uh, could you tell us more about the book? What can we expect from it? And will it be a substitute for the course or is it meant to complement the course in some way? Um, it's more like a complement of the course. It's like people like different things. Uh, I know I like videos on YouTube, but some people prefer reading it. Uh, I'm more of a notative person. So I like like someone teaching me something like a real course. But I know I know people, lots of people, lots of people like to learn with books. So it's going to be like the material is not that different from the course. Uh, there is a bit of new stuff, but it's mostly about deep learning from the foundation with the with the usual top down approach. Uh, we added a bit more about ethics that are usually covered like just for an half an hour in one of the lessons. Uh, so we like fleshed out the whole chapter with the, with Rachel's help, and. Uh, I think it's a real great one. Um, but other than that, uh, it's yeah, it's like the course, but in a book. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you can you give us an insight? How do you cover top-down approach inside of a book? Because books are meant to be bottoms up, uh, following the bottom up teaching methodology. No, you, not necessarily. Like the book is orchestrated with. Uh, four section. I mean, three three major sections. The first section is more like what can deep learning do, and for managers, for instance, uh, we would like to know a little bit about what it can do without actually doing some deep learning. Just like be aware of what the possibilities are and what the dangers are. And then the first part is uh, the top down approach. We like we start with examples and how to train models, and we gradually uh, while going through all the applications, like scrap a little bit the surface. And then the third section is like getting from the bottom up to the top again, uh, with how to write models in PyTorch and how to, to write a training loop and how to how to use uh, the, the middle level APIs in FastAI to, to get your data um, ready for a model and, and all that stuff. Okay. So it, it sort of covers both the part one and part two of the course. Uh, I know the course is divided into two parts. Yeah, it, it kind of tries to have all of that. So we couldn't have everything that's in the course, but we try to be as wide as possible because like we were, we were already we were already reaching 500 pages and the publisher is starting to get angry at us because <laughs> it was supposed to be a little bit shorter. And yeah, at some point we had to just stop <laughs> adding stuff. But okay. it tries to, yeah, you do a bit of both parts of the course. And it's, I think the end product is going to be, yeah, it's going to be a great book, very, 
very complete. Like for, for someone who really wants to learn about AI, it's going to be very comprehensive. I've already pre-ordered my copy, so I can't wait for it. But um, now coming back to the course, can you tell us what sort of efforts uh, on your side going to the course for the six months that we don't get to see you being very active on the forums? <laughs> uh so it's, usually it's mostly software development and research like we try to keep up with uh everything uh that happens uh in terms of research and also keep like improving the libraries so that it's easier and easier uh to use so that at each new iteration of the course like it's we can target even uh beginners, <laughs> how do you say that, like people that know ever less and less about coding and can still be able to train models and deploy them in production. So like with FastAI V2, it's going to be definitely going to be a little bit easier uh, for a lot of stuff. Uh, okay. And I'm very excited to, to see how it's going to go with, uh, with the course. And yeah, since, um, I mean, the book, uh, since we wrote all the book in notebooks, uh, it's going to be, we have tons of materials to, to show during the course. Like we're going to base it on the same notebooks. We are going to remove all the pros because, uh, I mean, most of the pros since uh, the, the goal is not to teach the book, but we're going to use kind of the same code uh, and the same material. Okay. Can you, can you give us a teaser of what can we expect from the course that's coming up? Uh, any new things that you're excited about? I know two things that Jeremy mentioned, uh, putting models into production, he said that might be covered. And uh, yeah. many, many improvements to the libraries. Uh, what, what other things might you be excited about? Uh, so yeah, putting a model into production, and I think he's going to show how to do that only in Jupyter Notebook, uh, okay. which is going to be super fun. Uh, so like writing all the app that then is deployed and all the code is in the Jupyter notebook with the, with the exported uh, model. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, I think he's, we, he's probably going to talk a little bit about uh, NVDev, which has been a very exciting project as well. Uh, and that has also given birth to fast templates, like plugging while writing everything in Jupyter notebooks. So those two things are probably going to be covered a little bit. Um, and other than that, yeah, all the new functionality from the library, like oh, it's easier to write new optimizer, or it's easier to to tweak the training loop, or oh, it's easier to get your data into into a model. And yeah, we try to also add some new debugging tools that I hope people will like and are going to make everyone's life a little bit easier. So. Okay, awesome. Uh, talking about research, uh, what kind of research do you like? What questions uh, do you ask while working on problems? And if you could give us an insight about your workflow of uh, working on ideas with Jeremy. Um, what do you mean? Uh, do you mean when we what do I look for in an article? Yeah. Or, okay. Uh, so we usually <laughs> go straight away for the results because like lots and lots of articles and increasingly if they are published at, I mean, if they are aimed at being published at big conferences, they focus a lot on the math. And then <laughs> when you scrap, <laughs> you discover that uh, there is nothing behind, like there is no actual improvement or results. And a great, a great example of that was um, uh, uh, the variant of Adam uh, Ames grad that was, that won the, the best paper award uh, at NeurIPS, um, not last year, but the year before. And like everyone was super excited about the paper. It was immediately incorporated in every major deep learning library. And like a year after, I don't see anyone using it because when we used it with Jeremy, we noticed that there was no improvement in training. And it's like a lot of high point about, yeah, they had the math and they had like found some kind of error in the proof of conversion of Adam and fixed it. But in practice, it didn't help at all. And yeah, <laughs> people are often focusing on the math and they forget that we don't know, I mean, we don't have mathematical proof or, or knowledge of why those neural networks work and generalize so well. So while math can sometimes give a good intuition, sometimes it's not really 
useful. So we, we focus mostly on the table of results first and then try to see if we can produce them and if there is an actual improvement in training by using that. So like one, one paper that we were excited about last year was like look ahead, like this new variant of optimizers where you you do five steps um, and then you take one step back and it's it works super great with any optimizer we try to to wrap inside it. So that's the kind of paper we're really excited about. Like not necessarily strong mathematical results, but something that actually works in practice and can make life easier for people using fast app. Okay. How do you distribute your workflow with Jeremy? For example, once you're excited about a paper and you're trying to incorporate into the framework, how, how does that pipeline look like? You mean when we add something or when we yeah. are general? Okay. Uh, usually we, we work pretty in parallel on different things and we just, we chat a lot on Skype and, uh, to just make sure that we are not working on the same thing at the same time because it's bound to, 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 to create conflicts. Uh, so yeah, mostly we work in parallel on different things and then we're going to see what each, of our, each one of us wrote and like try to it in that and make it a little bit better. Um, but mostly, yeah, it's it's been working well with just us and like when one of us is excited about something, he works on that, and then we we sh we, we show ourselves our results uh, afterwards. What what kind of efforts uh, go into making sure that all of the training can fit onto a regular consumer GPU? What what sort of things do you uh, efforts that go into making sure of that? Um, so the first one is that we try not to use uh, gigantic models and focus on the one that you know actually fits on Colab and use. I mean, like anyone's GPU in with eight gigabit of RAM. That's kind of our, our target, and make sure that. I mean, sometimes maybe it's going to be at a very low batch size, but at least we can train the model uh, on that. I mean, for most of the applications. You can have great results. I mean, as we show throughout the course, you can have great results without uh, worrying about um, using a huge model or top uh, or, um, or, the, uh, or, the, uh, or a huge data set uh, with billions of billions of gigabytes of data. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, I mean, for text, for instance, like even with the huge broad models uh, for text specification, all of it is still like pretty much state of the art. I mean, there was one article uh, that got better results, but the difference is not that significant. And those are models that you can even pre-train on one consumer GPU if you don't, if you're not in an English language, and then uh, fine tune on your data set. Um, so. Yeah, lots of excitement is going on to research where like the, all the big companies are showing how bigger they can make their models. And it's sure, it's sure there's uh, better performance after all, but uh, as you know, that's not what we're interested in. One area of research I'm really interested in is um, everything um, links to uh, sparsity and especially like printing models on in even kind of, uh, there, are, there are new articles about training a um, prune model directly. Uh, so that would make like those giant model could fit on GPU uh, that way. And uh, the problem is that it's a lot of, um, uh, you probably need a lot of custom code kernels because it's like a lot of sparse operations and they don't exist in uh, in PyTorch or in, in major deep learning frameworks right now. So um, excited about that. When I have time to actually <laughs> dig into that and maybe write some custom kernels, I hope we can bring that to fast AI. Okay. But uh, that's yeah, that's a trend, and it's also going to be very useful to put models in productions, and like you, you would be able to to train or fine tune your model on a, even on a mobile device uh, if it's like sufficiently pruned and not very heavy, so it could fit on a tiny chip on the, on your mobile, for instance. Okay, that's a that's a kind of research I'm excited about. Awesome. Uh, now, talking about the framework, can you tell us uh, what can we expect from the completely rewritten uh, Fast A2 uh, is the framework's name, uh, Fast A2. And if you could tell what was the most challenging task in building the framework, if you had to pick one. Mm -hmm. um, so what's new with Fast A V2? So the, the, for, for beginner and for someone who just used like the top level APIs of the library, 
nothing is going to appear that new because the top level is kind of the same as before. We did a little bit of renaming here and there, but the top level is looking um, quite the same as before. We just reworked the data block API to make it more, more user friendly. Uh, so yeah, if people were just using that, they're not going to find the library that changed. Uh, what's really new and what's really exciting is all the effort we put uh, in the middle level APIs. Um, because FASA V1 was written with like low, low, all low level functions and then directly the high level APIs and there was nothing in between. So when a user wanted to customize anything, they basically had to go to the bottom and they were telling us it was kind of hard to understand what was for, for, for very foundation functions we were doing and like rewrites uh, a high level API with them. So we made sure like all the mid-level, we built the mid-level API and make sure it's like for, for an experimented user, very usable. And so that's the part I'm really excited about. So the middle level API is going to be very useful for the people who have like very weird data sets, for instance, and it doesn't necessarily fit with the data block API and they can directly tap into that and grab their data. And for all the examples we've seen so far with people using the, 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 the pre-release of V2, uh, it's been working very well for them. And all, all, all of those users have told us, yeah, it's so much better than V1 because it's way more usable. Another part is like the generic optimizer, so it's going to be very easy to write new optimizers without really having to uh, to copy and pass like lots and lots of codes for, from the official implementations. Uh, it's also going to be used um, it's also going to be easier to, to write the trick of the training loop with the callback system. So it's, the callback system is not that different from V1, but it's been reworked and just made more user-friendly again. So uh, it's going to be, yeah, a lot better. Um, my favorite part is um, the type dispatch system we implemented uh, in Python, which was also the most challenging part. And the whole, uh, and the whole like all the data augmentations we wrote and all the transform rewards, uh, you can add uh, a new behavior of a new specific type you created. So for instance, if you have like a 3D image or, or an image where you want like flip rotation to be applied in a custom way that's not exactly the same way as a regular image, you can create your own type and you can create your own implementation of the transforms. Like, and it, you can still call rotate from FastAI, but you can write the implementation of rotate for that specific type uh, using our type just pass system. And it's the same for, like if you remember in V1, you have this method like show batch and show results, which show you like the results from your training or, or what, your data, what your data looks like. And those methods are also written with the type dispatch system. So if you have your own new types, you can customize the behavior with your new types very easily. And so we made that part. I mean, in, in V1, it was really hard for people who had to, to, to write their custom types. And when they wanted to inject custom behavior for those, it was kind of hard for them. So we made it uh, easier with a type dispatch system. Okay. Awesome. Which I hope people will like <laughs> as well. I'm really excited about it. Uh, but uh, the other side to it, how can uh, we contributors from Fast A best help in the development of the framework? Do you think it's it's ready beyond the fact that we can't contribute or do you have any aspects that we could possibly contribute to right now? Uh, for V2, I mean, contributions right now is more like it's not trying to contribute by writing the software. The contributions we work on right now is like using it and trying to, you know, put some code you have we had working on V1 and see if it uh, ends up being easier and cleaner in V2. And if not, telling us and telling us what the issue was, finding bugs because, of course, uh, lots of bugs and we have to fix them. So, I mean, for, for us, the most valuable feedback we can get, it's not necessarily like a PR to implement that function that's not there yet. It's more like, I used it and this was working great, but this was not working so great. And it's really important for us to know um, to know that before we can clean up V2 and make that the official release. It's probably going to be, uh, I mean, V2 is probably not going to be official or re officially released uh, until the, the MOOC is done uh, because we're going to use all the, um, all the beginners at the next course as like targets and see <laughs> what, what kind of difficulties or what kind of bugs they, they, encounter, they encounter and when we fix everything and make sure like they find V2 working nicely, we're going to make an official release. So it's probably not going to be before June or July that V2 is officially released 
and means a fast AI repo. Okay. Now uh, coming to another aspect of fast AI that I think many people forget is the forums, which are also at the heart of the course. You are our official teacher, much more than Jeremy. You are very active on forums. You almost answer every single question when the course is live. What questions do you really enjoy answering? Uh, is there a favorite category that we can ask you in the for, for the future students? <laughs> what questions do I really like answering? First of all, I think Jeremy is almost as active. I mean, he's probably more active than I am. I mean, I focus mostly on the... Um, uh, I, first, I, f- I only focus on the course from during the course. To be honest, I don't follow the course from that much once the course is over. And I'm focused more on the fast AI user from like when people are having difficulties using the library and I try to help them with their bugs and and like that. And so to answer your question, uh, what kind of... <laughs> Do I like more like what kind of questions do I not like? <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't like uh, questions that are more um, a lot of users are come on the forum and are like, Yeah, I tried to do this very vague thing and it didn't work, and they leave it at that. And I'm like, Yeah, if you want us to help, maybe you're gonna have to tell us a little bit more about what you tried and what, what, you did, what didn't work. So the questions I like are people coming with, I tried to do this and I had this error, and where they show all the code they had and all the stack error trace uh, message. And I look at that and I can find pretty easily what the bug was, if it was in record or if it was in fast AI and like fix it if it was in fast AI. But yeah, I'm pref- so the kind of questions I like are the, the detailed question with all, all the information about what was tried and the code that was written and the return that was given by, uh, by, by Jupyter or by Python. Okay. Okay. Uh, for, for the course material, what best advice do you have for the students who are approaching the material, but how should they spend their coding time as Jeremy calls it? Um, like he said, like the most useful thing is always trying to, to, to redo what's done in the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, and on the same data set, but more excitingly on a new data set, like something that's not necessarily uh, assembled the same way, uh, maybe a Kaggle competition that looks kind of like what's done in the course, but it's slightly different because it's always when you we struggle, I mean, you learn a lot when you struggle to get your data ready for your model. And I mean, a lot of fast AI is about making that as easy uh, as possible. So you will learn a lot about fast AI when you try to actually put your data inside a model when it's not uh, like NIST or ImageNet or like that canonical data set where everything is so easy. Uh, so yeah, trying to, to redo what's in the notebooks. Um, if you are live in San Francisco, going to the study group is probably very valu- valuable uh, and working with like other students. And if you're not forming a studying group, uh, an online studying group where you have I don't know, Slack or Skype or Zoom, uh, where you can actually chat during the day and and during your coding time so that you can, you know, interact and show, yeah, I had that kind of difficulty and someone can help you. And because it's good to go on the front, but it's also good to try to help people that are kind of the same level as you in terms of coding and like try to understand what their own message was. And if you can figure out what was wrong with our code, we will also learn a lot uh, this way. And yeah, then use the forum to have either show what you've done or if you are you, if you have difficulties, like post, uh, like I said, with all the code and all the wrong message and, and what you try to make it work but didn't work and, um, and then try to help other people on the forum. But the most important thing is actually try to code by yourself. Just never just take the notebook and press shift and turn repeatedly until you arrive at the end because that's not the way you will learn. I mean, you won't learn anything that way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, once uh, we get enough proficiency, Jeremy recommends uh, students to build projects. Uh, do you have any suggestions or advices for that? How should we go about uh, building project or finding those ideas? Um. I mean, the first thing is you should pick, I mean, one should pick something they like, uh, something they're really excited about, uh, something they have their own expertise about. If it's a person that's not um, uh, the software engineer, uh, they have they probably have some expertise about some kind of data, for instance, like medical data set, or I don't know, a journalistic data set, or 
um, because like we new exciting things often come when people bring their own expertise into deep learning. Uh, so yeah, find the project you're passionate about, and uh, if you have no idea, like look at Kaggle competitions. Uh, it's good um, past and present. It's a good idea to. Uh, I mean, it's it's good to trigger some ideas and maybe like try try so try on one of them and interact with the community there. Um, but yeah, your your own project should come from something that's dear to your heart because it's going to be easier to work. And you since it's never going to work on the first try, no, it's going to work on the second try. Uh, you will have to to try maybe a thousand times before it actually works. Uh, it's it's. I mean, you really need something you're really interested in and very passionate about because you're going to have to be very very. Um, how do you say that? You're going to have to try and try again. So. Okay. Be sure it's, it's something you want <laughs> uh, to try and try again on uh, like a thousand times. Awesome. A good example is like Jason uh, with the old DeFi. I mean, it took him months before the, f the, the first model worked and it was just very persistent and tried again and again and again because it was something he was really passionate about. So yeah, that's really the, the biggest thing is pick some project that you're really interested in. Otherwise you're going to drop it after a few, it fails like five or six times and it's going to be, it's not going to work. Yeah. And now, now the Oldify is also launched as a business uh, for him. So yeah. if, if you persist enough, uh, it can also turn into a business, your side project. Exactly. Now, if, if you were uh, to give a final best advice to the future fast A students in person, online or via the MOOC, what would that be? Uh, so like I said, like I just said, be persistent <laughs> because deep learning is hard and especially like deep learning cuisine when you try to train a model is very, very hard. <laughs> so be persistent. Um, uh, actually code, like don't just read or follow the videos, but do some code in Jupyter Notebooks. And if you're not uh, a big coder, it's going to be hard at the beginning, but Again, be persistent because that's the, that's the only way you're going to learn anything. It's just, you, you're not going to become a deep learning practitioner just by watching the videos. You actually need to get your own dirty and do things to, yeah. for that to happen. So spend as much, as, you, as much time as you can coding and like uh, try pick, pick a project you like or a competitions and like try every day to make it a little bit better. Uh, because that small incremental steps are, I mean, are key to building something great at the end of the day. So. Okay. I'd, I'd also have a request to the students. Please be as respectful of Jeremy and Sylvain's time on the forums, please. Do your homework before asking the question. And like you <laughs> said, please pose the questions in a proper format so that they can really help you. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, before we end the interview, I also have a fan request for you. Would you ever teach one lecture, maybe more than one lecture in the future, next one or the future version of the course? Uh, I don't know about that. Jeremy is like is a better is a way better teacher than me and myself, especially with English be, getting in the way. So I'll probably leave Jeremy the teaching. I mean, I'm better answering questions on the forums or developing notebooks uh, and then or writing blog post. I'm not sure I'm going to actually deliver lectures. <laughs> okay, but please do consider it as my request. And uh, Sylvain, thank you so much for all of your contributions to Fast Day and the machine learning community. And thank you so much for joining thanks, on the podcast. Thanks. Now, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.